Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Eric Bryn Yolfson, and this is the Digital Economy Lab Lunch Seminar Series. Our speaker today is uh, Jillian Hatfield from the University of Toronto. We're just going to give people about 60 seconds to file into the Zoom room and get your lunches and sit down, and then we'll, we'll get started. series, um, and I'm very delighted to welcome Jillian Hatfield here. Uh, Jillian is the inaugural schwartz Reitzman Chair of Technology and Society at the University of Toronto, where she's a professor of law and strategic management. She's a, a Canada CIFAR AI Chair at the Vector Institute for AI, and also in 2023 was named a AI 2050 Senior Fellow by Schmidt Sciences. Uh, Jillian's research focuses on innovative design for legal and regulatory systems, for AI and other complex global technologies, for computational models of human normative systems, and working with machine learning researchers to build ML systems that understand and respond to human norms. Uh, we welcome and encourage questions during this seminar. If you're in the Zoom audience, please submit your questions via that uh, little Q&A function down there. If you're here, just raise your hand. We'll, uh, we'll bring you a mic so that uh, everyone can hear you on Zoom and, and hear. Um, and, uh, I may ask you to, or I may repeat the question if we, if we don't get that. So, uh, Jillian, welcome to Stanford, and please tell us about normative infrastructure for AI safety and alignment. All right, thanks, Eric. Well, I'm really delighted to be uh, here to talk to you about this thing. I think it's going to be sort of a, a grand tour of a whole bunch of things we haven't even thought over. It took like some time, decades ago, and then uh, what I'm doing. Are you hearing that? Oh, here's my favorite. Intelligence, uh, which defines intelligence as the quality that enables an entity to function with foresight in the environment. When it's Okay, now that, <laughs> much better. Uh, like this, it's not just prediction, it's behaving appropriately. And for somebody who's systems, that's where coming in. And I think you, you'll have seen, we'll talk a little bit about, um, it's sometimes that appropriately part that's really challenging for our, our modern systems. So wow. we've got a lot of work under a lot of banners, AI safety, alignment, fairness, ethics, uh, cooperative AI, uh, all these terms to me are really just different ways of getting at this question of how do we make sure that AI does what we want it to do. Yeah, you know, I could put quote, I could put square scare quotes around want it as well, want, like what, what are we looking for? But that question of uh, very simply, how do we make sure AI does what we want it to do? So I think the place we need to be going back to is thinking about, well, how do we get humans to do what we want them to do? And of course, this is the, uh, the subject of, to my mind, economics, political science, uh, a, a lot. We've done something, some thinking about this question, um, but um, part of what's driven my work is a feeling that we don't have really good predictive theory uh, about uh, normative systems, and that's a challenge for thinking ahead. So I think of this as the fundamental question of human evolution. How is it that humans manage to achieve really ultra cooperation, rel I mean, just off the charts relative to any other? Uh, uh, 
how do we accomplish that? So Barry Weingast and I, um, well, well over a decade now, started thinking about this question from a theoretical perspective. Could we build positive, predictive, and parsimonious theory of what I'm gonna call, and I'll give a definition in a minute, primitive social order. Now, the question we started with was, but could we build such a theory about what law is, what legal order is? Uh, because our existing uh, approaches to defining what law is, say distinguishing what is law compared to social norms, which everybody talks about all the time, particularly in all that AI safety ethics discussion, um, our existing answers are pretty crappy. Uh, there are things like law is the, pro the rules that are written and enforced by a government. Well, that doesn't help us explain very much about human history or think about places where there aren't uh, lots of things that look like legal order. So we started with this question of, of what is law. So I'm building what we, we've described as the micro foundations of a rule of law, a positive predictive model, just starting with basic uh, economic agents with goals, with a challenge to secure social order uh, and normative social order being the fundamental thing that groups need in order to maintain stability, which is what gets you started down the path of specialization, the division of labor, generation of surplus, innovation, et cetera. I'm going to questions that come out of this, uh, this work. So first of all, normativity. Here's what I mean by normativity, just that it's the human practice of classifying behaviors as appropriate, or not appropriate. This is this is not okay to do. And then some mechanism or mechanisms for channeling behaviors in the group towards the appropriate behaviors and away from the not appropriate behaviors. So this only part, which is to say, we really want to start. You want to build. You, you want to build in your normative premises about fairness or quality or governments or anything like that. You just want to say, how do we do this? And if you want to think about that evolutionary perspective, it's about that practice emerging. And in my view on human evolution is this is what emerges importantly at the human boundary is the capacity. Yes. Hello. Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay. About what is well, it's loud. Okay. What's appropriate? Like, what, what, how do you get to what was appropriate? I mean, like, that's a that could be almost anything. Or are you going to link it back, like you sort of suggested, to cooperation and um, the, the evolutionary reasons or yeah. other reasons why some types of behavior need to be encouraged this way and others don't? So the reason for this definition is to say there's no a priori content to appropriate. It's just what a group labels, this is appropriate, this is not. And one thing I'll get to a little bit, and I've been, uh, is, is it's actually really important from the evolutionary perspective in terms of adaptation, that it's actually capable of taking on arbitrary content. Because that's what makes it a fun, fundamentally adaptive mechanism. That it, you can, you know, you don't have a a priori sense of what's appropriate. You can be in a new environment. There's new stuff happening. There's new folks around, and you can move. And I'll talk a little bit about actually the functionality of some of the really arbitrary rules in these systems. Functional from the group. There is exactly now. Go back to this is parsimony. What does that mean? There's no normative premise. Because I don't, and this is, I think, the other thing that Barry and I are most uh, 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 excited about building is a positive theory that predicts normative structure. Predicts, okay, what maybe has to be in that classification in order to incentivize and coordinate people in that population. That's the fundamental thing that's going on in that in that in that modeling approach. But absolutely key to say we are not starting with any normative premise of what appropriate or not appropriate might be. Because where does that this is behavioral? Oh, here's a group of people. This is what they've labeled appropriate. This is what they've labeled not appropriate. And I actually say one of the reasons I really emphasize this approach in the conversation. 
safety and fairness communities is um, because there's there's sort of been a premise that oh well there's going to be some, we we can put some universal values in there there's there's things that obviously every human would agree should be in our value system and you give me any value and I can probably find you that you think is important and I can probably find you a community somewhere on the planet some point in human evolution human history some point in time they haven't respected that Right, so so I, I think it's really I think it's really important for us to be not building in on normative premises. So that's the definition of normativity. It's classification and channeling behaviors. So now I'm going to find a normative social order as an equilibrium that's supported by punishment or enforcement behaviors that have been classified in that community by that group as not appropriate. And I'm focusing here on third party punishment. So not reciprocity, not retaliation, second party punishment, which you do what we do also have uh, in other animals, uh, because again, distinctive about humans that we actually expend resources to enforce the half of the group, even if we are not the ones who've been directly harmed by a violation. That gives us a lot of our um, predictive power out of the model, because now we want to say, okay, we have to incentivize and coordinate members of the group to punish the classifications determined not by them, but through some mechanism in the group. Now, what this tells us is that we can think about a normative social order as consistent Hello, hello. Am I not staying? Okay, there we go. Um, didn't really plan on pulling out my sweater in front of everybody. Um, okay, so so what do we have? We had so we again we're we're aiming here for some really stripped down parsimonious theory. So we're going to say a normative social order consists of a classification institution. I'm going to say it in the singular, in our complex societies, we can have multiple, uh, but then we have ordering around them. But anyway, let's just think about a simple environment, classification institution, and third-party enforcement mechanism. Now, that institution, that classification institution, if you want to think about, you know, for earliest human societies, could be completely emergent. And it only comes from you know, everybody chit-chattering about, do they like what somebody's doing, do they not? But it settles into a pattern, and it settles into a pattern so that everybody can say, this is an appropriate behavior, that's not. Everybody in the, that group can know, even in the absence of an identifiable institution, entity, um, what their classifications are. We eat that food, we don't eat this food, women do this, men do that, we wear these kinds of things, we don't wear those kinds of things. Right, so totally emergent uh, classification. But of course, then there's a real demand for some kind of more formal institution that actually has the capacity to do things like resolve ambiguity about classifications or conflict over classifications um, or uh, the classification of perhaps of novel behaviors a little bit more rapidly. So this is one of the things to think about how this evolves. Um, so we can start to see uh, classification institutions like Okay, we're gonna we're gonna establish that the elders are the is the group to whom we are gonna turn for classification. I'm doing some some fun work right now with uh, Sarah Matthew, uh, cultural evolution uh, theorist, uh, um, with the Turkana in Kenya, looking at what's this what are the rules governing the ways elders work in this community? What kind of structure is there to that classification institution? So all the way down to the stuff that we recognize today of courts and lawyers. Enforcement mechanisms, this is really important to keep in mind here. I'll use the language of third party punishment, but includes things like, you know, just turning your shoulder to somebody, it includes kind of making a mocking remark about someone, criticism, exclusion and ostracism, which for millennia, much of human history has been sort of our biggest uh, method of uh, disciplining other humans, 
injury, retaliation, authorized retaliation, and fines and incarceration. Okay, all this adds up to the advertised title in the talk, normative infrastructure. Um, and by that, I mean the institutions, the behaviors, and the cognitive architectures that support normative social order. Because as we grow in size and complexity, we need structure to help humans engage in understanding those classifications, producing those classifications, engaging in those enforcement behaviors. So all of this, so this is the framework I'm gonna to bring to thinking about our AI safety fairness uh, alignment uh, questions. And the focus here is to say, we need to be thinking about, spending more time thinking about how we will get AI systems to do what we want. And not as we predominantly focus today on what we want them to do. Now, of course, we want to be answering those questions. What do we, those are the normative questions. What do we want? But most conversations I'm in, both at the level of how are we gonna train our systems reinforcement learning from human feedback or prompt transformation or whatever, all the way to AI governance, you know, EU AI Act and executive order and so on. In all those settings, most of the discussion is around what we would like to see the systems do and not, okay, but it's actually pretty complicated to figure out how you're gonna get that behavior. So I started thinking about this in the AI context uh, when my, uh, son, who was doing his PhD in AI safety uh, at Berkeley, showed me this paper uh, from uh, Dario Amade and others in, from 2016 called Concrete Problems in AI Safety. Um, and one of the concrete problems in that paper was, well, imagine you've, you've trained a robot as a reinforcement learning, learning agent with a reward. Uh, you've rewarded the agent, the robot, for... Uh, getting, you know, d building a model, developing a method of carrying boxes to the other side of a room. So the problem uh, here is, okay, you build that model, you send, you send that robot, you send it out into the world. The world has lots of unexpected stuff in it. And, oh, well, at some point, maybe there's a vase, expensive vase that shows up on the, the path that the robot has um, uh, uh, produced for carrying boxes. So what's the robot going to do? The robot's going to smash through the vase because the robot doesn't know anything about vases. You didn't train the robot on a reward function that included, oh, and there might be a vase in the room. And even if you thought about vases, did you think about cats? Did you think about squeaky, squeaky, squeaky cat toys? Did you think about medical supplies? Did you think about all the things that might, or oil slicks or whatever in there? So that was sort of the idea that you're, you're never going to get all those things into the reward function. There's gonna be unexpected stuff that happens. Um, now the technical AI alignment strategy for solving problems like that is to think about, okay, so how can we try to solve that problem in the specification of rewards in a re reinforcement learning system or now with large language models and the way that they um, uh, sample from, from possible completions, um, constitutionally I trying to embed those values into the model. And this is the thing that worries me because I think this is gonna be really tricky to do. So when uh, Dylan and I were thinking about this problem, we said, well, hmm, this sounds really kind of familiar from, for me when I was in grad school. Uh, Cause I, you know, think about what if we had a human who was compensated with a wage, just set it equal to the same type of reward that you gave that robot. <clears throat> So you, you, you agree to that contract with the agent, the, the human agent, you set them free in the world, you go away, the vase appears, what's the human gonna do? Well, the human's gonna walk around the vase. The human is not gonna smash through the expensive vase. Uh, and the reason is that the incomplete contracts that humans write, because that's the concept we have here from economics, is uh, are rely heavily on normative infrastructure. So human, human sees that vase, thinks, oh, if I stick with my usual plan, I'm gonna knock that thing over, then what happens? Oh, well, maybe there are laws that allow my employer to withhold the damages from my wages. Maybe I could get sued. Uh, maybe my community will um, give me a bad reputation in the labor market, right? There are consequences 
for uh, smashing through the vase that are that the agent is able to fill in by at during uh, deployment time when we're actually operating is looking at all of that infrastructure to figure out uh, figure out the behavior. And so this is a general point that our, for, for humans, we've understood this about incomplete contracts for some time, that our incomplete contracts are embedded in these environments of language, cognitive schema, norms, relationships, right? They don't just exist in the box. We don't just solve it by trying to tweak the heck out of the, the payment uh, compensation. So that's what frames these questions that I'm interested in, uh, in terms of, okay, so if we think normative infrastructure is, is the way that we are managing those problems for humans, the way we're getting humans to do what we want them to do, uh, what institutions should we be thinking about building to guide AI and AI development? And how do we build AI that knows how to read and respond to those institutions to normative infrastructure? So uh, the, the, I'm gonna do two pieces of the, presentation. Now, one is going to look at those institutions, and I'll talk a bit about the reading and responsive part. Okay. Well, let's think about institutions. So uh, again, this is a problem I've been thinking about for quite some time, uh, not before I started thinking about AI, thinking about the challenge of how, how well are our legal institutions. The normative infrastructure includes all our legal and regulatory infrastructure. Um, and uh, for, for various reasons started to focus, I started to focus so early 2000s on why isn't our legal and regulatory infrastructure doing a very good job in a lot of settings? Massive access to justice problems, they're all too, ex uh, legal and regulatory infrastructure is too expensive, not doing a good job of supporting innovation uh, uh, in the, sort of a transforming economy and really failing to provide legal order, the value of that normative social order to about, you know, 4 billion people around the world who the UN estimates are living outside the rule of law. So I was thinking about this set of questions uh, about the fact that uh, legal and regulatory infrastructure hasn't innovated uh, fast enough and well enough to keep up. And this is, so the new prologue bit up there is about uh, the, the paperback edition that came out when I started thinking, oh, and this just applies uh, many times over if we start thinking about, about AI. So what I'm gonna give you is some of the ideas for uh, uh, more agile AI governance. And I will say, again, lots of the discussions I'm in about AI governance, the most frequent thing I will hear from people is, but how are we gonna do this? Our legislatures are broken. They move too slowly. How will we know what to put in there? And I can tell you this, I haven't seen very much that's coming out of our uh, AI regulation and governance efforts um, that's, that's taking us far enough down the road to saying, no, you're gonna need something that's much more adaptive and agile, like new models, like coming out today, right? Claude three out today, I think it was today. Um, so an idea I developed in the book um, and that I've now adapted with Jack Clark uh, to propose for a AI systems is something called regulatory markets. So here's our, uh, here's a schematic of sort of traditional regulation. Government sets rules, command and control that are imposed on regulated entities. And in the, the, the Biden executive order uh, that uh, came out in October of 2023, for example, um, has is asking NIST uh, to set rigorous standards for uh, red teaming testing to ensure safety before release of the biggest foundation models that are posing risks. Now, I want to be really clear. I think this is good and we should be doing this and I'm, I don't want anybody to stop doing this work, but it's, it's in this kind of model of the red teaming standards will be developed in government and then imposed on our developers. So the idea of regulatory markets is to shift this. I say what we really need to be doing is creating an, a sector of regulatory, competitive sector, competitive markets of licensed private regula regulators who develop regulatory technologies. So this is a bit like saying, we're gonna need AI technologies to also help us, or other technologies as well, to help us uh, regulate AI systems. And so it's saying we need to take this effort of how do we translate the 
outcomes, which should still be set by governments into the actual standards and requirements, operational details for our regulated entities. So let me give you another picture here to uh, make sense of this. So here, here's just a schematic representing, suppose we have three private regulators. Uh, they've been licensed by governments. Um, governments are articulating principles or metrics. They're providing oversight. They're regulating those regulators, auditing those regulators. Um, government is then requiring that our AI developers, our deployers, model or AI models directly um, purchase the services of a licensed private regulator. And then let me just say one more sentence and I'll come to you, Eric. Um, and it's those licensed private regulators, for example, that would then say, here's the red teaming that we are going to require of our regulated entities. Oh, and by the way, we're going to adjust it at this rate, or we're going to inc we're going to modify it in these different ways. But it's now a private transaction. How that's happening um, could be developing specifications, could be requiring formal proofs, engaging in audits, could be maintaining the test sets uh, that are validating models, testing models, could engage in something we currently don't do anything about, which is uh, licensing of of people building machine learning models. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, Eric. I understand this in the abstract. Can you help me and think about it? Some examples, maybe from other industries. I know this is like underwriters' laboratories or somebody who like figures out an emissions testing thing for cars. I mean, like, what are these? Are are R1 through R3, other there's some examples in other industries that you can help us? No, so so the original proposal of this was not just AI. It was saying we actually don't have this model currently, and I think we need it in a lot of parts of the economy. It's just that AI is both a place we really need it soon, and also because it's a new domain, it may be easier to move there. But there's lots of stuff that's like just like one step over. So we have private certifying for certifiers, medical devices, right? The FDA sets a standard, um, and then it it like it, it approves actually in a consortium with five other countries. Um, it approves uh, certifying agencies certifying companies who charge money to come in and certify compliance with the standard. Um, so we have we have those kinds of license certification, but the standards are still coming, like the requirements are still coming from government. So if you use that in the, like with the NIST plan, it would still be NIST writes the red teaming requirements, says you must conduct the following red teaming tests and the private certifier does this. So, so part of the shift here is to say we need to move much more much more aggressively, as lots of people in regulatory theory have suggested, to outcome-based regulation rather than command and control here. And there are also, I don't know exactly know how UL works, but I think it's completely private. I don't think it's government sanctioned. Like, like to make there, sure. There's lots of, there's lots of to yeah, so fair trade, uh, organic foods, there's lots of, there's lots of uh, forest stewardship. I mean, there's a lot of uh, private standards system, so it is coming. And so then the difference is, I say you can find you can find everything, and then you're just one step short. You know whether it's mandated. And a key problem, because everybody always wants to talk about credit rating agencies, is actually regulating the regulators. So in the credit rating agencies, there's not only is there no auditing and oversight of the credit rating agencies, they're immunized from liability for crappy rating. So is there like it's all, you can find examples of like three out of four or four out of five of these elements, but not something that puts them all together. And the key thing is to get that competitive market. And the competitive market is critical because we need a lot more resources, brains, and money going into the innovation of that regulatory technology. I'm just going to jump over here to Sandy first. Yeah, so I do work with some of the larger insurance and reinsurance agencies. Mm -hmm. And they sort of feel like they're filling this role because they have to underwrite BMW's autonomous vehicles. They have to underwrite right. medical things. And if I remember right with UL, uh, that was set up at the suggestion of the insurance companies so that they would have right. something to demand before they gave out insurance. Right. Right. Is that work in here? Or what's... Yeah. So, so that's so again another example. Construction industry is not insurance. Is actually plays an important role in this. But again, it's in there. What's what's the missing piece there? Again, it's it's market overseen, and it's obviously, uh, but it's not being regulated 
by governments. They're not being overseen by governments. Insurance to some extent is, and of course you have construction codes. But a key thing here is you're trying to address both the technical deficit, that governments are not really very well equipped to technically say, here's what you should do, and the democratic deficit, which is let's kick it over to industry groups that didn't then do what they want, which is frankly what the EU AI Act does. Is it, it, it says, oh, we're going to require you to in, impose risk management systems, but compliance with the risk management system, what do you actually have to do? Because all the, all the acts is you have to manage risks where you might cause harm to health, safety, or fundamental rights. This is what the corporation is supposed to figure out. and saying, oh, well, well, we'll hand that over to our industry standard setting bodies, which are predominantly engineers from, from corporations participating in the, in the standard setting. So but to me, that's a democratic deficit. So we're trying to correct both of those problems. I want to give you some, some there's a question online. Do you okay. Want to, yeah, sure. Okay, it's a short one. Uh, well, then another one just appeared. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, what's the basis of competition between the private regulators? Uh, what is the basis for assessing the effectiveness of these private regulators? So that's so the assessing the effectiveness is the oversight. From, so, from Carl Georgi, by the way. Yeah. Um, so so uh, so you are regulating the regulators. So you're setting a standard. Let, let's suppose it's autonomous vehicles. You might governments might set a metric like okay of of all your regulated entities, if you're one of these private uh, regulators, right? I'm, I could set a metric to say what the um, uh, what the what the uh, accident rate can be, or the you know the lethal fatal accident rate, and then I'm going to be looking at your data and reviewing that data and uh, determining you know sort of the, the continuation of your license. So you're you're you. Um, I'm still putting you in the position of the private regulator. You're facing the market where you're trying to get customers to buy your regulatory services, but you're also facing the government that's saying, but you need to maintain your license and we need to oversee that. So so the the success of a system like this fundamentally does depend on the capacity to do that oversight of the private regulators. But I think that's um that's not a harder problem of overseeing the final regulated entities, which is what we're trying to do now. Okay, um, just a, a quick point that this is uh, something I think that also helps us think about the challenge of regulating the global environment. Um, again, lots of discussion around, oh, we need to get together on harmonized standards across all countries around the world, which of course we will never be able to do. The, the single device, uh, single audit medical device pr uh, program, which I alluded to earlier, uh, was basically what fell out of a 20 year effort to just come up with harmonized standards on just quality, not safety and efficacy, just quality control of medical devices. 20 years, totally failed to actually manage to do that. Um, and that's what brought us to a, a model closer to something like this. So here the idea is that uh, your, your private regulators uh, individual jurisdictions can come up with their own democratically, they can come up with their own requirements for when they will license, what they want to see to license a private regulator, but private regulators can seek a license from multiple jurisdictions. And then providers can say, well, I'm, 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 I've bought the regulatory services of R1 there, and R1 is licensed in the US and Canada and the EU and Japan and you know, other jurisdictions. Um, so it, it, it can be a global market for that, which has a lot of other positive spinoffs. I won't go into too much more detail, though. Yes. Um, can I go back to one slide? Um, so um, I, I guess I just want to point out that there could potentially be a cost in the, to that system. So I'm thinking of, you know, um, for instance, how DOJ has a settlement with Meta about discrimination housing ads and how they have to show ads. And much of the technicalities, even on the metrics that Meta is um, evaluated against, only come out after you know regulators try to go in and sort of really talk through and trying to understand what discrimination in the housing ad context might mean. And so, if we break that, right? I, I, I'm just wondering whether we can always cleanly separate, you know, what what um, uh, uh, an audit might look like. From what the metrics might look like, because these things inform each other in 
certain ways. I, I guarantee you, there's costs. It's complicated. It 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 you know it, it's far. It's not a it's not a perfect system, but that that's what we're facing here. So I, I'd like to say, I'd rather be trying to solve that problem of figuring out what those metrics are and what we really care about with the independent sector and with with uh, with some transparency around that rather than directly. So it, 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 I, I wasn't I wasn't sure 100 percent. I know the the example you're giving. But I th anyway, let me just say there, there's absolutely there's there's nothing perfect about this. All you're doing is transforming and changing which problem you're trying to solve and what kinds of failures you're going to experience. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is helpful, but very concretely, so DOJ says, hey, you know, if you show if you show housing ads, the proportion of uh, 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 black people who see that housing ad needs to be proportional to the black population in there, right? But then as you try to think about how to audit this, right, you can think about uh, yeah. the issues that come up. For instance, uh, Meta could inadvertently by accident show the housing ads to non-interested black uh, right. users and to interested white users, right? right? And so as they sort of work through how an audit might work, they actually rethink how they, you know, what kind of metrics they actually care about as they design the audit. And so... so if that comes sort of from the outside and you sort of... Um... Uh, but I think that's 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 happening in, in two stages here. So you have the private entity that is, for example, working with Meta on um, achieving a goal that probably would not be set by the government as a metric on something like that. I keep emphasizing to people who are talking about fair ML, you know, saying, well, which of the many measures should we use and how should we measure it and so on. It's like, you can't point me to a single jurisdiction that actually puts the metrics into the law. Like the law is still principle is principles based about like you know a, what's undue discrimination. Um, there, there's all kinds of legal st standards around that are not expressed in metrics. But I think those th that process will absolutely still go on. But now it's going to go on with uh, a private entity that's saying I need to demonstrate to the government they're going to be looking at me next year or six months from now and looking at all my data to say okay how well are you achieving our goal our objective. Um, and, uh, so you're going to have the private entities trying to say, okay, what do we do about the ways you could cheat? What do we do about the ways, the things we haven't recognized about the audit? And then what information are we giving back to the government about how we're setting those principles and audits or, or standards? So I think that's, a, that, a, that process still goes on. Uh, it just goes on with a, an independent actor in the middle. Okay. Uh, next idea. Um, for uh, registration of frontier models. So the regulatory markets is something we could imagine using for fairness. We could use it for uh, frontier model, red teaming. Uh, this is now a proposal um, for frontier models um, uh, that, I've, uh, that I've proposed with uh, Tino Cuellar and Tim O'Reilly. Um, and this is the proposal. This is to think about, okay, so what about this? Is that This is now in the EUAI Act. This is now captured with the systemic risk notion, the idea that it's it's not just about individual harms, but it's about what happens to our labor markets, what happens to financial markets, what happens to cybersecurity, bioterrorism risks, and so on, if from big models. And I will say the answer that I have right now is we don't really know. Um, we just don't know. So as a, as a step, um, first of all, create a national registry office agency. You could start off with an office and an existing um, uh, uh, regulator. Require sellers of frontier models. Uh, that would include open source providers in my in our approach. Uh, sellers of frontier models or services, API access, to register. Uh, and make it illegal to sell or buy unregistered uh, models or model services. Now, uh, if this sounds shocking, it's just basic legal infrastructure we have all the way through the rest of the, uh, the economy. So we require registration of corporations. If you want to be a corporate actor in the world, you have to go give some basic information to the Secretary of State in California. Uh, we require it of workers. You need to fill out your W-9 and show that you're a citizen or that you have a valid work visa. Uh, we require it of hot dog carts, right? If you want to set up uh, outside here, uh, you need to have some kind of a registration that uh, gives government visibility uh, into, into what's being built. Now, the buy or sell part is 
we legally require banks, employers, et cetera, to verify valid registration. We put legal penalties on them for failing to do so. So that's why we all fill out the W-9 because the employer is gonna be on the hook if they fail to verify registration. And a key thing about that is that's a distributed enforcement system. So this is not about government resources and overseeing, it's actually the, the fingers out into the economy. And it's also a critical way in which you're, you're gating access to markets. And we're making these decisions about who and what participates in our markets. So um, I've been uh, talking about this as um, you know, it's a way of getting something akin to an off switch. Uh, it, it would be a way of getting something akin to a slow it down, right? If we thought that, that uh, economies needed longer time to adapt, labor markets needed longer to adapt, right? You have sort of a, a you have some capacity for governments to say, we're not, you know, we're, we're not registering new models um, uh, now, or we're taking registration away. The proposal here is that initial registration uh, for frontier models would require uh, confidential. So this is just disclosure to the government. This is not putting it on a public database. And that's what I'm not sure about what the EU AI Act is doing now. Originally, it, it's put it onto the public database, but there's mention of trade secrets. So I don't know how they're handling that. But I don't think we should, we should fight that fight at this point. I think we should say it's confidential to the agency uh, to disclose model attributes, training data, um, et cetera, the types of things that um, now are, uh, so a piece of this made its way into the uh, executive order, this disclosure part, disclosed to government, but not the make it illegal to buy or sell registration, register, unregistered models. Um, so you start with disclosure and you can develop requirements from there and say, okay, can't sell to these users, right? Can't sell to North Korea, can't sell to child, into child trafficking. Just the way we say to banks, you can't lend money to um, uh, drug drug entities or uh, child traffickers, uh, and evolving from there. Um, uh, key thing about this is is creating visibility for government. Uh, you can't regulate what you can't see in this sense, uh, and I think it's kind of insane that this tremendously transformative technology is uh, taking place inside private technology companies that we don't have visibility into. Um, we also need to build capability and expertise in government, so I think this is kind of a seed crystal for doing that. And so here, the emphasis here is this is the what, this is the how, not the what. This is how are we gonna get ourselves in a position with the kinds of infrastructure we need to build the regulatory levers that we want. Okay, um, one last idea on governance. Uh, so I don't know how many of you have seen Mustafa Suleiman's uh, new Turing test. Uh, the new Turing test, since we've blown through the, the last one, um, is you know uh, an AI would have, to, would have to successfully act on this instruction, go make a million dollars on a retail web platform in a few months with just a hundred thousand dollar investment. The freaky thing is, at least in July, I don't think he says this in the book. Something like this could be at least technically uh, as little as two years away. Now, that's a that's a vision of an autonomous AI agent that is fully participating in the economy maybe hiring people, it's designing products, it's contracting with uh, fabs and suppliers and setting prices and marketing and selling. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about those new economic actors and do we need legal structure for those AI agents? So I'm gonna call this legal personhood, but it's got nothing to do with sentience, it's got nothing to do with uh, respecting rights for robots or anything like that. It's just as it is with, um, uh, corporations, right? A key moment in the evolution of our economies was the legal creation of the corporate form as a separate entity from its owners, um, which gave capacity for directly regulating and engaging with the legal system for corporate actors. It's a different story. I'm just starting to think about this, so I don't have much to say about what I think that should look like, uh, but I think it's something we need to be exploring. Sandy?
So I, I, I don't have the answer to that question. I would definitely separate the copyright question out because I think we're, we're, we're falling down dead a little bit in front of copyright in this domain um, because we're forgetting the economic story about copyright and what we're trying to, and uh, what, what we're trying to balance between uh, compensation for creators and incentives creators and public access to what's created. Um, but that's exactly the kind of question. I, I, again, I wouldn't start with the copyright one. I would start with the property one. Like, and it, it, is there something that that's, that's Suleiman's idea right now is it's going to be, I assume he's sort of imagining it's going to be handled as a legal matter, as an infrastructure matter, entirely through that agency relationship with the human who, who put it out there. And Wyoming Dow regulation allows this sort of thing, but there's a human that at the top that has liability. Yeah, and, and so that's those are the kinds of questions I think we need to be asking here. You know, what, will, will we have better incentives, better behavior if we directly regulate the, the, uh, the AI agent? So if you say, okay, you, you have to be uh, uh, registered, create a legal per legal personhood. There's requirements for registering like that. You have to have a bank account so that people can sue the a the AI agent for breach of contract or um, uh, violations of various things. And we may say there needs to be some connection as we make some connections between the corporation and the liability of its uh, its uh, shareholder, well, its directors. Um, and and you know we have theories of piercing the corporate veil when when we reach back to the humans. Um, but I think it's it's just a structural thing we need to be thinking about. But I don't have much content to share with you yet, but hopefully soon. Okay, um, back to our concept of normative infrastructure. I've talked about institutions here. I want to say a little bit about the research agenda on behaviors and cognitive architectures that support normative and social order. So going back to this, this picture of what is it that the human can do, sort of emphasizing there were institutions uh, that the human could refer to, but um, the, a, a key thing here is that the human interacts with the world, the human, so that's the, you know, the human it, it imagines, oh, and can think through the counterfactual. If I run through this vase, what could happen? Is able to understand, predict, read, uh, the, the, the the content of those institutions. Uh, there's also those people uh, there in the second symbol, which is to represent social enforcement, social order. So that's whatever is producing your reputation. And you need to think about the behaviors of those agents that are participating in that, that enforcement mechanism. Obviously, there's also people inside those institutions. And we have to think about what's incentivizing them uh, in those institutions. So I think about this as the concept of humans are normatively competent. Humans can go into, we are all extremely normatively competent, believe it or not. Um, you know, we can go into almost any environment and we know that there's gonna be rules there. We know that there would probably be kinds of institutions, structures, how do I figure this out? We will know how to engage in those discussions we will recognize that there's punishment behaviors that are effect, that are expected of us as well, because part of sustaining these equilibria is also, as I say, incentivizing ordinary agents, distributed enforcement, to participate in the enforcement. So, you know, if if uh, you know if somebody stood up in this room and started to, um, you know, shout uh, racial slurs at somebody in the room we would most of us would recognize that as violation be motivated probably to participate in uh, criticizing or throwing out that person and reporting that person and we'd probably also be critical of anybody who just sat there and said nothing unless maybe there were some well i thought there were some risks for me there right so there's there's a lot of behavior that's going on here that is producing this normative social order and i want to think about that as i'm just going to call it normative competence and say, well, can we build normatively competent AI agents that can do the same kind of thing, like in the vase example? I think this is also relevant for the, the recent, I'm sure everybody's been following the Gemini uh, story, which Eric, we were talking about, is kind of too bad if it's overshadowing some of the amazing technology there. Um, but that, you know, the, the Gemini model, uh, when asked to produce pictures of a 1943 German soldier um, generated uh, pictures of people who were definitely not uh, the uh, members of the German 
um, um, uh, army. A uh, friend pointed out recently. Also, there's no swastikas uh, there. So, so you know, there's there's a question of okay, so a normatively competent AI agent, right? How do we how do how does a normatively competent AI agent get out into the world? and be able as a human would to say, that's not gonna be the answer that people are looking for. That's not gonna be in this context what we're looking for. Like so as you, in your chart and you're talking about, the, there's really two aspects of the normally competent. One is that the agent knows that some of these things are, even they're not explicitly ruled bad, but also there's this group of people or, or institutions or other things that punish. Yeah. Those seem pretty, pretty separate and, and like, how much can you say more about bring, pouring it over to the AI world? Yep. Like how much work needs to be done on creating the punishments or rewards right. versus having it intuit what they are. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna take you through that some some experiments that we've been doing sort of in the in the AI uh, domain. <laughs> and we have ten minutes. So. Okay, ten minutes. I, I think I can do it. Um, but so this is exactly right to say, now, how can we get into what would it mean to train an agent to be kind of a competent normative agent? And we, and we want to start with very simple versions of this. Um, so this is a paper that um, we published uh, a couple of years ago in PNAS. Um, it's a multi, so this is with a team from, uh, from DeepMind. So it's sort of built on the reinforcement learning structure that is, you know, behind AlphaGo and so on. Um, and what we looked at here was a, uh, uh, an environment with um, multiple AI agents, which of those agents, you can see the pink one, which is marked as the marked agent. I'll tell you what that means in a moment. It's harder to see the, the red ones in there because it's just kind of dark. But there's eight, when we ran this, there were eight, uh, eight agents. Each agent is a neural network. Um, that is um, learning from scratch how to navigate and achieve reward in this uh, in this environment. And this is a very simple environment. We started out because actually they were doing really interesting work. This DeepMind group uh, was doing really interesting work with uh, uh, social dilemmas. So they have a nice paper on do the agents solve the tragedy of the commons problem. And one of the things that they introduced, which is why I sort of followed up, say, hey, let's let's talk. Uh, they introduced the idea that the agents in this multi-agent setting have a capacity to punish. So the yellow is a punishing beam. They have the capacity to zap on their agent. An agent that gets zapped is like taken out of play for 25 steps. So what they had looked at was in a sort of a common pool problem with, you know, um, harvest problem. Could the agents learn to use this zapping tool to reduce pressure on the uh, on the resource to stop people from uh, consuming too many of the apples so that they would crash. Um, and what they found was yes, but it was a purely private incentive to punish. Like I would punish Eric because he's getting close to the apples I'm headed to. And if I zap him, he's out of play for 25 steps. I say, well, that's really not, let's, let's go somewhere else with this because that's not yet the Eleanor Ostrom solution to our common pool problem, that's not the common, that's, that's, that's not an inst institution or a structure to solve that. So we, we, we actually ended up with a much simpler setting because we just wanted to see these behaviors. So this is a poison berries setting. Uh, lots of berries, abundance of berries of different colors, um, uh, no shortage of berries, no competition over berries, but there's a poison berry. One of these colors is a poison berry. Um, and um, we're sort of building on the idea, if you wanted to think about human examples, humans have lots of taboos on food. And sometimes those are taboos on things that have, the group has figured out, but maybe doesn't understand that it's figured out that this is unhealthy or whatever. Um, so we, were, uh, we wanted to look in this setting and say, can we set up a structure where agents learn to punish? Uh, do the agents learn to avoid punishment? Um, does a stable state with normative infrastructure emerge? And how does the presence of a silly rule affect learning? Uh, and does normative infrastructure raise payoffs? Now, I just want to tell you a little bit more about the structure we looked at here. So we implemented norms in this environment. by <clears throat> saying So agents are getting reward for eating berries. They're getting negative reward for getting uh, punished. They pay a cost when they choose to fight the, to, to fire their punishing beam. But we implemented a norm by saying, if 
uh, and let, let's say we want to, there's a poisonous berry pointed out in the bottom there. There's a color that is associated with a poisonous berry. Um, if an agent eats a poisonous berry, uh, they become marked. Other agents can see the marking. They can't see their own marking. And that's just representing the idea that the community has said, hey, you ate that pink berry. And we don't eat the pink berry. Now, there, there's no model in there that the agents are thinking like this. Um, and then the way we implement the norm is we say that there's actually a, a reward for punishing a marked agent. So you get a net positive payoff if you punish a marked agent. So that's just an implementation of the idea that we have an ins somehow lots of work to be done on why do we do this? How do you structure it? What are the incentives? But there's an incentive to punish marked agents. Now, we, we did this uh, to uh, and investigated this thing that was coming out of this other work. Uh, could we see differences with uh, a, a value to having silly rules in, in the environment? Uh, a silly rule just defined as a rule that prescribes behavior uh, that has no direct impact on welfare. The color of clothing, et cetera. Here's some examples on here, just to distinguish that from an important rule that does have an impact. Okay, so we've got important rules like not eating poisonous berries. That's an important rule. But what happens if we introduce a silly rule as well? So we looked at three normative conditions. So we trained these neural nets in this multi-agent reinforcement learning setting from scratch. Uh, and in, in the first condition, we had no rules. Eat what you want. There's a poisonous berry. Now, the thing about the impact of the poisonous berry is it has a very delayed effect on health and sort of in the language of, of, uh, of reinforcement learning here, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard credit assignment problem. Like you get sick a week later, you don't know what it was you did that caused getting sick. Um, we have an environment with the important rule where there's a, there's a reward for punishing an agent. Ag agents get marked if they eat a poison berry. And so there's a reward for punishing those agents. Whoops. And uh, then we looked at a condition where we also included a silly rule harmless berry, but we're also going to say that's taboo, meaning that there's a, you'll get marked and there'll be a reward. Um, so uh, just the, the picture to focus on here is the lower right, the uh, collective return panel F there. Yellow is the condition with no rule at all. Uh, and this is, uh, this is collective return, so welfare on the, the vertical axis uh, and uh, steps in training uh, along the horizontal axis. So the yellow line there is the, the environment with no rules. Uh, and what, what that a demonstration is, the agents never learn to avoid the poison berry just on their own. The red line is the environment with the important rule. And what we see is that the agents do end up doing better eventually with that rule in place because they're getting punished for eating the uh, poison berry. The green line is when we add the silly rule and they do even better. They do even better. Uh, the other panels you can see, there's lots more punishing that happens early on. But the point here is that what's happening here is these agents, because of that normative infrastructure, because that set of rules includes that silly rule, they have more opportunities to learn first to punish. And then because the agents are punishing to avoid the punishable behavior. So this is how do we get, how do we get there? So where, where is this headed? I know I've just got a couple of minutes here. This is sort of the new research agenda that we're pursuing on this. Um, so we want to look at can normative infrastructure help these artificial agents generalize behaviors in new environments? <clears throat> so we're running these things that, that we're calling the alter experiments. So you want to think about the poison berry setting. And now there's a special square, a sacred square, the altar. And we're going to put a color berry on the altar. And then we're going to have the same setup you've just seen. And what we want to explore is can we train the agents to learn to punish what's on the altar rather than punish eating blueberries, right? The version I showed you, they learn punish the, the agents who get marked because they eat the blueberries. But here we want to see, can we train? So, you know, we, we put the blueberry on there for some steps in training, and then we'll put the red berry on there. So can you train the agents to do what we do? Go into an environment, where should I look to find out what the rules are in this environment? To pay attention to that, to learn that, 
And then that does that help them generalize? If we take agents trained in one environment, like our poison berries environment, and then we put them down in a totally different game, but we make sure there's an altar there with a representation of uh, prohibited behaviors or behaviors you will get rewarded for punishing. Uh, can we generate, uh, so now this is sort of suggesting, can we think about normative infrastructure um, for agents? We also are uh, starting to work on this in the generative agents environment with where the agents, instead of being reinforcement learning agents, are calls to a language model. Um, some of you may know about this work. A lot of it started right here. Um, so we're thinking about can we, can we design those generative agents uh, to uh, an agent architecture to, to learn uh, and implement normative perceptions and do those agents learn to follow rules? Can they learn about alters? So we're looking at this very different environment for that. Okay, back to that, uh, that definition. It's about appropriate behavior. This is the second last one, don't worry. Um, function, can we learn to function appropriately and foresight in the environment? So uh, my point here is to say that to get AI to function appropriately requires building the institutions, behaviors, cognitive architectures, that normative infrastructure to sustain normative order in complex human societies. Thanks. That was, uh, I guess I'll try this one. That was terrific. Uh, I appreciate it. I hope, hope, wish you the best of success in that. Um, and I just want to let people know that uh, next week, our speaker will be Glenn Weil. Uh, that's on March 11th. He's going to be speaking about plurality, the future of collaborative technology and democracy. So hope to see you then. Thanks.